like something about Seattle felt very dirty. Not, again, like I, it sounds bad because that came to my mind right after I mentioned that man. But the thing is, is something was very corrupt, obviously. I'm, I'm being tortured and poisoned right there, right next to, right next door to the FBI offices. I didn't know how to, who to trust. So here's this black African-American man coming out. You know, he could have been somebody who was kind of trying to help me, but I never knew. I didn't know who was trying to help who because a lot of people were trying to um, kill me or have me entrapped into something to make me look horrible and just get me out of the way. Or they were trying to put me into a psychiatric ward and call me crazy to discredit me. I, I mean, I... Every... This... So with the menace, and I didn't know who was connected to who. Somebody thought I had a bunch of information on someone that they were very worried about. So I, I half the time with the law enforcement came up, I didn't know if they were part of a criminal group or part of a good group that wanted to help me. And I was really afraid to even say very much, even though I would try and to call them up and see if somebody could help me. I didn't know who was part of the all the crime. And honestly, if somebody was part of crime, but they weren't criminals hurting me, I really don't care because, honestly, if um, if there was a criminal that was at least trying to help me, they weren't they weren't a criminal that was trying to harm me. And a lot of these people who are claiming to be law enforcement and legal, abiding by the law people, they some of those people were trying to harm me. So I guess that makes them criminals, but they, they definitely didn't um, attach that to their lapel. So I I talked to this African-American man. I wasn't sure what to think about him. I didn't really know for sure. I had somebody tell me that someone in that police department, very high up, was involved in some kind of drug ring. So I was kind of nervous because I didn't know if he was part of that or not. You know, maybe trying to help me, maybe not trying to help me. But I told him that somebody had tried to poison me. I gave him my, my information. I said, is there any way? I said, I don't have any information on anybody specifically for anything. But I really need to be in some kind of a witness protection or safe program or, or um, something because I'm being tortured and I'm being... Um, and I am being poisoned. I maybe was nervous that, you know, if he was black, you know, did he know this other black man who was looking into my eyes and watching for signs of something when I, when I was at that Mexican restaurant? But, you know, just because he's black, I mean, there are tons of people that are white that have done really horrible things. So, you know, maybe I wondered a little bit, but I just didn't know. <clears throat> and he said that he would look into things and he took a report. But then I, that was all that there was to it. He said, there's nothing really that I can do. Nothing more I can do. He said, you could talk to the U.S. US Marshals. Or he said, he possibly said FBI, but I don't know for sure if he did see FBI. He might have mentioned FBI or not. But I know he said Marshals because I had brought up the witness thing. So I called the U.S. Marshals and they just sounded like they thought everything was like a joke. Like they sounded very comfortable and at ease and... Like, everything was great with, with their offices. And here I am, you know, um, in horrible circumstances. So then, I didn't get anywhere talking to the U.S. Marshals. And then, <clears throat> I then tried to walk to the FBI offices in person to give my, my report. And I went to their I went to their doors and it was close to closing, but if they hadn't completely closed yet. I remember the, the woman, a couple of the people who were waiting for me to show up, they I had called ahead of time and then the couple of people that were down at the counter uh, down in the lobby below, they looked like they really hated me. There was a woman and I think a man. There were like three people that I could see from the outside. 
and they really, the, this one woman specifically looked like she hated my guts. They did not look happy to see me at all. And then this man came out of the FBI offices, I think just leaving work, or happened to be leaving, and I caught him, you know, just as an aside, and I said, could I talk to you for a moment? Because basically I went to the FBI offices after they told me to go there in person, and then they said, where's your ID? Basically, I had somebody steal my, um, my driver's license while I was doing this um, traveling, and it was either stolen at this man's house that I was just staying at, or it was stolen um, at the hostel. But I don't think, I remember my bag and everything seemed very secure. I checked everything when I got it at the hospital, when I got it back. Nobody had been through it. I, I believe I had, like, my ID because I had to get, um, somehow I had to get a Greyhound ticket. And I had to show my ID for something. So I showed it when I was in Tacoma. And then after that is when it was stolen from me. And I think the only other place that I really was after that was um, at this one man's house. Except for the time that um, potentially when I was in the hospital, the Virginia Mason Hospital, and I had to leave my things to the side. But I'm, I kind of think I had my purse with me still, but I don't remember if they maybe put it off to the side, but I think I had it with me. Anyway, my driver's license was stolen. And after it was stolen, I remember those FBI people said to me, where's your driver's license? They said, you can't come in here if you don't have ID. Um, I have like a 120% feeling that it was somebody connected to the FBI that stole my ID because the excuse was said in such a satisfied way and with no foreknowledge that I did not have it with me so they basically tried to ban me and block me from going to FBI offices and making any kind of report in Seattle FBI after they stole my driver's license And I said to them, I said, I don't have it. I don't know where it is. It got stolen. I don't know where it is. And I believe it was stolen. And this woman said, well, you, you can't talk to any of us. We, we, we're not going to let you in unless you have your ID with you. And I had something else. I had like a social security card or like a food stamp card with my name on it. I had something else that showed something. And I said, can't I give you this? And I offered some kind of alternative thing. And she, they said no. And I said, I came all the way over here. I said, I, le I left a message with the FBI offices in Seattle from Wenatchee. And now I've had a whole bunch of horrible things happen. And I listed some of those things, like some of the crimes that had happened. I said, I need to talk to somebody about a situation. And I said... I had my driver's license and it was stolen. I said, can't you let me talk to somebody? I was told to come here in person and now I'm here in person and I'm in a really dangerous situation and I need to talk to somebody right away. And um, I was turned down. They already knew who I was. They didn't even need my ID. They knew who I was. They could see from my face. They could compare it to what files they had on me already. They could, they already had my fingerprints. If they needed a, a positive confirmation, they could have done a fingerprint or a thumbprint or any kind of print. And I told them that I had, I mean, 
don't tell me that the FBI refuses to see anybody who has had just had their ID stolen from them. You know, the, the FBI only opens its doors to card-carrying members who are not victims, who just happen to have all of their papers on them at all times. You know, that would maybe not be a victim. So here is an actual serious victim standing outside their doors and um, and some of their employees are probably the ones that did some of these things. And this man that was leaving, he let me say a, a couple words and then he refused to talk to me. The other people who were behind the counter came out and said, you can't talk to her. So they came out from where they were and they basically told him not to talk to me. And then... I believe it was after I tried going to the FBI. That I lost my singing voice. <clears throat> and I was given some kind of a poison that caused a um, melting of some type of um, metal. Or created, had a, um, a burning inside of my throat where the metal was. And then I had a metallic taste in my mouth. And uh, my voice was ruined after that. And um, the man that I was staying with asked me about that metal in, in my throat and asked what it was made of, where it was, that kind of thing. And then I was t trying to talk to the FBI, and then after that, I think I stayed the night at his house. And... Then the next morning, I went to this coffee shop. I had a tiny little espresso at this one coffee shop that was next to an Irish pub. And then I went next door to the Irish pub and asked someone if I could, um, if they had a light or a cigarette. And I just went to, I wanted one cigarette. I wasn't smoking that much. It'd been about two months, two months since I'd smoked very lightly. And these two women were standing there and they gave me a cigarette from a Marl Marlboro pack and <clears throat> then I was I went back to the coffee shop where I had my espresso and I was sitting there and I put the cigarette to my mouth and as soon as it touched the tip of my tongue felt a burning sensation. And I didn't really think about it because I, I thought, well, that's really weird. And I had already lit it, and then I decided I went ahead and I, I smoked some of it a little bit anyway. And then I drank my espresso, and then all of a sudden I had this burning um, in my in the metal in my throat. Like something basically was burning up, like acid or some kind of something I just I it wasn't like an exterior technology feeling it was like I had just um, as soon as I had the cigarette to my mouth and touching my tongue I had a met there was a metallic kind of a taste and then there was a burning sensation in my throat after I inhaled the cigarette. And then I um, blogged about what had just happened to me because I was right in the middle of feeling those symptoms and I had my computer with me. So I blogged about the women who were just still next door. And after I blogged about them, I described them and what they were wearing. After I blogged about them, they got up and I saw them leaving 